Good morning. Welcome to this last day of the Leap for FNSSA Stakeholders Week. <clears throat> it has been a very busy week for most of us, and today is the last and fifth day. We are welcoming you. We are welcoming you to this webinar organized by Desira. You will find in the chat box the link to all the projects presently approved and running of this era in the chat box. You are requested to put your questions in the question and answer box, not in the chat box. You will find mutual uh, translation. We have two interpreters, Céline and Barbara. You will find the icon below your screen on the right, this little globe and it says interpretation. We are already 30 persons online. I will now switch to French. Bienvenue à cette cinquième journée du consortium Leap for FNSSA. Ceci a été une semaine très chargée pour beaucoup d'entre nous. Cette dernière journée, nous commençons avec le panel Désira. <coughs> Pardon, Désira, vous trouverez dans le chat un lien qui vous permettra de vous connecter à, à, à tous les projets de Désira. Je vais faire suivre ce lien par le programme où vous trouverez les différents panélistes et le, la séquence des différentes interventions. Les différents panélistes ont tous une opportunité donc d'être écoutés sous mode interprétation. Vous verrez au bas de votre écran, à votre droite, l'icône qui est une icône qui représente le globe avec interprétation. Donc là, vous pouvez ou bien choisir pour la langue originale, le français ou l'anglais. Nous avons rencontré un petit problème technique, c'est que beaucoup de personnes ont enregistré sous mon nom. Donc, dans le, box, dans le chat box, souvent apparaît le nom François Stepman, mais ce n'est pas moi, c'est un clone. Il y a moyen néanmoins que vous puissiez corriger votre nom en mettant donc, et remplaçant François Stepman par votre nom. Je repasse maintenant à l'anglais. We have encountered a small technical problem. Several persons have registered for this webinar under my name with my link. <clears throat> so you will find many Francois Stepmans in the chat box. You are requested to change this from Francois to your own name, uh, which will make it far more intelligible for us to see who is joining us. So I suggest we start, it's now six past the hour and we start with the first presentation by Christophe Larose. Et bonjour à tous. Um, attendez. Bonjour à tous. Donc, je, je vais m'exprimer en, en français. Je suis Christophe Larose de la Commission européenne, la Direction générale pour les relations des partenariats internationaux, pardon, et l'unité qui, 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 qui s'occupe des questions de, 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 de systèmes agroalimentaires durables et, et pêcheries. Voilà, j'ai bon, le plaisir de, de pouvoir donner une petite introduction à cette, à cette session et surtout de, de, de faire une référence à cette initiative d'ESIRA, Development Smart Innovation Through Research in Agriculture, que l'on a lancée en décembre 2017, avec l'objectif de contribuer à une transformation qui soit pertinente sur le plan climatique, productive et, et durable, de, des systèmes agroalimentaires dans les pays à faible revenu, revenu intermédiaire, avec finalement et surtout deux, deux objectifs euh, euh, au cœur de cette initiative. 
Euh, un premier qui est de, 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 de remettre plus de science dans, notre, dans, notre, dans le développement, dans nos opérations de développement, avec euh, bah, la compréhension que traiter des objectifs de développement durable, euh, ça nécessite forcément de la connaissance, euh, c'est intensif en connaissance, et puis à la fois ça doit être aussi pertinent par rapport au contexte, donc euh, spécifique par rapport au contexte. Un deuxième objectif, ou en tout cas un deuxième élément fort de, de cette initiative, c'est euh, son attention aux approches multi-acteurs et euh, je dirais une, aussi une, une, euh, encore une attention forte au développement des capacités pour l'innovation. Donc, bien sûr, il y a d'autres éléments thématiques, mais ce sont je dirais, deux, points, deux points assez forts de ce qui nous a semblé important lorsqu'on a conçu et, et, et lancé cette initiative. Donc, la session d'aujourd'hui euh, va porter finalement, surtout sur euh, une discussion sur les différents modèles d'innovation euh, pour soutenir l'innovation en tant que telle euh, dans le système agroalimentaire en Afrique en particulier. Et euh, donc, porter une réflexion sur euh, quel rôle, quelle contribution de la recherche à ces, à ces questions et aussi une, une réflexion sur quel type d'amélioration, quel besoin d'amélioration des politiques d'innovation euh, qui s'appuieraient euh, sur, euh, sur ces approches partenariales euh, fortes et efficaces. Et aussi donc, un, une euh, recherche et innovation qui, euh, qui s'oriente, qui, euh, qui contribue à l'impact en définissant le plus clairement possible ça, cette contribution à l'impact. Donc je m'arrête ici, je vais passer la parole à mon collègue Guy Fort qui va rentrer un peu plus dans les détails de, du sujet du jour. Merci. Bonjour, vous voyez euh, l'écran Parfait. Voilà. Euh, je vais également parler euh, en, en français. Euh, je vais présenter une réflexion sur le rôle de la recherche dans, dans l'innovation, comment la recherche peut contribuer à, à cette innovation et appuyer les processus d'innovation. Alors, ce, cette présentation s'appuie bien sûr sur euh, des réflexions à partir des premiers projets Désira, mais aussi sur des travaux de recherche qui ont été menés euh, sur ces questions de, de l'appui à l'innovation. Alors, je vais commencer par dire qu'il y a dans, le débat, dans les débats internationaux, dans les débats scientifiques, mais aussi dans la communauté, de, communauté praticien du développement, deux modèles d'innovation de, qui sont discutés et qui sont, euh, qui sont plus ou moins mis en œuvre. Le premier modèle que l'on connaît bien, c'est le modèle de transfert de connaissances et de technologies. C'est celui qui a permis la, la mise en œuvre de la Révolution verte avec l'ensemble de ses euh, pratiques agricoles, de ses techniques. Dans ce modèle-là, l'innovation est plutôt perçue comme étant euh, technique avec euh, un modèle linéaire dans lequel la recherche produit les connaissances et met au point des, des, des techniques, des technologies. Les services de conseil diffusent ces connaissances auprès du plus grand nombre des agriculteurs et les agriculteurs mettent en œuvre ces, ces pratiques-là. Les agriculteurs ont un rôle dans ce sens-là passif. Dans ce modèle, la recherche, bien sûr, joue un rôle déterminant avec ces méthodes, avec ces technologies, avec ces, ces modèles. Et les interactions pour mettre au point ces nouvelles technologies, pour qu'elles deviennent innovation, sont... Ces interactions avec les acteurs sont relativement limitées, elles existent, mais elles ne sont pas au centre de la, de la question. Ce modèle-là, il est toujours dominant, toujours fortement utilisé et il est assez efficace quand on veut traiter des questions simples, par exemple la mise au point d'une nouvelle variété et sa diffusion. Il a aussi l'avantage que c'est un modèle qui est vu comme étant, permettant une standardisation des, des, des pratiques et donc peut s'appliquer assez rapidement à large échelle et favoriser une diffusion à, grande, à large échelle de, de nouvelles technologies. Euh, 
Le deuxième modèle qui est de plus en plus discuté, mis en avant, c'est celui de le modèle multi-acteur pour favoriser l'innovation. Dans ce cadre-là, la vision de l'innovation est différente. L'innovation elle est, elle est, est variée, elle est technique, elle est organisationnelle, elle est institutionnelle. Et on considère que les connaissances nécessaires pour promouvoir l'innovation sont distribuées entre les acteurs. Et le pilotage de l'innovation est incertain. On ne sait pas très bien où est-ce que l'on va arriver quand on se lance dans une aventure pour favoriser le développement d'innovation. Dans ce modèle-là, ce qui est important, c'est le rôle des, des, des réseaux formels ou informels d'acteurs publics ou privés pour construire des connaissances, pour accéder à des ressources, pour générer cette innovation. Dans ce modèle-là, la recherche joue toujours un rôle, peut jouer un rôle, mais c'est une contribution. Elle contribue à l'innovation en interagissant avec les autres acteurs. Euh, ce modèle-là, il est euh, efficace pour adresser des problèmes complexes quand on, euh, ces problèmes doivent être traités par un nombre important d'acteurs. On peut penser au développement de chaînes d'agriculture biologique, chaînes de valeur d'agriculture biologique qui vont mobiliser un ensemble important d'acteurs pour pouvoir se développer à l'échelle. Mais ce modèle-là implique que euh, la façon de s'organiser dépend du contexte. Et euh, on peut aussi ajouter que ce modèle-là prend de plus en plus d'importance. Hein. En Afrique, on parle de plateformes d'innovation, comme le FARA le développe. C'est autour de cette conception du modèle d'innovation. En Europe, ce sont les partenariats européens pour l'innovation qui sont les modèles promus pour favoriser cette innovation. Euh, maintenant, je vais euh, essayer… On, essayer de comprendre comment on peut appuyer les processus d'innovation. L'innovation, en fait, c'est un processus non linéaire, mais c'est un processus qui va permettre le développement de nouvelles façons de faire, de nouvelles façons de concevoir là, et des nouvelles pratiques agricoles, des nouvelles organisations. Euh, ce petit modèle d'innovation avec cette spirale montre que euh, l'innovation commence par euh, une idée initiale d'un groupe, euh, petit groupe d'acteurs ou d'un entrepreneur qui va développer euh, euh, son idée petit à petit, va commencer à expérimenter, c'est la phase par exemple de planning, Développer des prototypes, c'est la phase de développement, et puis mettre en place à, une, à grande échelle euh, son, euh, son l'innovation hein, technique, organisationnelle, institutionnelle, c'est la phase de ré réalisation. Et ensuite, cette, si cette innovation rencontre un succès, elle va se diffuser et, et être répliquée par d'autres acteurs dans d'autres situations. Finalement, pour appuyer l'innovation, on peut appuyer l'innovation à ces différentes phases de, du processus d'innovation. Quand on est à la phase initiale, au démarrage du processus d'innovation, Initial Idea or Inspiration, dans ce graphique-là, ce qui est important, c'est de favoriser les échanges d'expérience, le, le brainstorming entre acteurs pour identifier de nouvelles idées, parfois un peu folles. Et ce qui euh, se met en place, c'est le support, l'appui à des, des réseaux informels d'acteurs et souvent soutenus par des petits fonds hein, qui leur permettent de développer à très petites échelles un certain nombre d'initiatives, de tester. Quand on est dans la phase d'expérimentation et de, on va dire, de prototypage, les appuis se formalisent avec des appuis à des réseaux qui sont de plus en plus formels. Et c'est là que l'on va voir se développer des mécanismes comme des plateformes d'innovation, quand on parle d'entrepreneurs, des incubateurs qui permettent de, 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 de mettre, d'expérimenter des nouvelles façons de faire par des entrepreneurs. C'est là que l'on a aussi des, la mise en place d'expérimentations de, participatives et c'est le domaine pour, euh, pour ceux qui ont connu le projet, qui ont travaillé dans le projet CDIS, Capacity Development for Agricultural Innovation Systems, c'est le domaine des niches d'innovation où un certain nombre d'acteurs se mettent à expérimenter des nouvelles façons de faire et euh, développent euh, des, des innovations. Quand on est dans la phase 
d'implémentation à grande échelle de l'innovation, on retrouve des services beaucoup plus classiques, en particulier des, du conseil plus de masse qui permettent la formation des agriculteurs ou des acteurs. Euh, C'est également le, le lieu où on va mettre en place des, des champs de démonstration et les mécanismes de financement sont plus classiques, ce sont des, accès, des accès au crédit. Pour se coordonner, les, les acteurs ont besoin de mécanismes plus formels de coordination et de pilotage de l'innovation. Dans les phases, de, finalement, des dernières phases pour euh, favoriser et inscrire l'innovation dans le panorama institutionnel, des politiques publiques peuvent favoriser la mise en place de normes, de taxes, de subventions qui va permettre de, de développer et d'inscrire de, de, cette innovation dans le paysage institutionnel pour le plus grand nombre. Ce que l'on a, pour, euh, quand on fait une synthèse de ces différents types d'appui de, de, et de support à l'innovation, on peut considérer qu'il y a quatre services génériques d'appui à l'innovation. Le premier, c'est un service euh, visant à faciliter les échanges entre acteurs, à jouer des, des fonctions de, 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 de broker, d'intermédiaire, dans le cadre de réseaux formels et informels. Le deuxième, c'est un service qui vise à renforcer la capacité des acteurs à innover, à développer leurs capacités techniques et fonctionnelles à différents niveaux, au niveau individuel, au niveau des organisations, au niveau des institutions. Le projet CDIS que j'ai évoqué tout à l'heure visait à renforcer la capacité des acteurs à innover et a largement investi ce champ-là, montant que c'était un mécanisme important pour favoriser l'innovation. Un troisième point, c'est l'accès au financement. Et ça, c'est un point important où on doit jouer sur des mécanismes de financement variés suivant le stade de l'innovation en mixant des financements publics et financements privés. Cette ingénierie des financements est certainement à développer, notamment en Afrique, pour favoriser le, le, la, la, la mise au point et la diffusion d'innovation. Enfin, le dernier service, c'est celui de la production de connaissances pour l'action, là où la recherche est souvent reconnue dans ce domaine-là, mais en valorisant à la fois les connaissances locales et les connaissances scientifiques. Donc, on peut, dans ce cadre-là, on peut considérer que la recherche peut contribuer à l'ensemble de ces services. Ce n'est pas le seul acteur qui peut fournir ces services-là, production de connaissances, facilitation, un, un renforcement de capacités, mais elle peut y contribuer et jouer des rôles qui sont spécifiques. Sur la base d'un certain nombre d'expériences, enfin, d'études de cas, on s'aperçoit que la recherche peut jouer ses euh, rôles, d'une part en assurant une production et dissémination de, de connaissances, les principaux, c'est là qu'elle est fortement reconnue, elle peut jouer un rôle dans la co-conception d'innovation, donc avec les acteurs, en expérimentant, en mettant au point des nouvelles technologies et des processus, en développant des, des, des méthodes. Elle peut aussi jouer un rôle autour de la gestion de ressources, qui n'est pas un rôle fortement reconnu, mais quand on regarde ce que font les projets de recherche et innovation comme Désira, la gestion des ressources pour faciliter le développement de, de processus d'innovation est un élément important. Elle peut favoriser, elle peut appuyer les acteurs à innover, pas simplement en aidant, en, en aidant à concevoir des innovations en, production, en produisant des connaissances, mais aussi en participant à la facilitation de ces réseaux euh, des réseaux d'acteurs ou en jouant des rôles de, de plaidoyer et de conseil auprès d'un certain nombre d'acteurs et notamment auprès, par exemple, des politiques publiques. Le rôle de la recherche est reconnu pour fournir un certain nombre de recommandations. Enfin, elle peut jouer un rôle dans le renforcement des capacités des acteurs à innover via des formations formelles ou informelles d'étudiants, de, de chercheurs, mais aussi et surtout d'acteurs du développement. Pour jouer ces différents rôles, pour assurer ces différentes fonctions, il y a différentes façons d'organiser la recherche. Il y a différents modèles d'intervention de, de, de la recherche. 
Le premier modèle, qui est le modèle classique et qui renvoie à ce fameux modèle de transfert de, de, de connaissances et d'innovation, c'est un modèle où finalement le chercheur, la recherche a une vision assez claire des objectifs à atteindre, mais aussi a un contrôle fort sur la production des outputs, de, des produits de la recherche et sur la production des outcomes, des résultats. Et finalement, les interactions avec les acteurs sont toujours nécessaires. Hein. Si on parle de développement de, de nouvelles semences, on a besoin, les, les chercheurs ont besoin d'interagir. D'une certaine manière, pour ce type d'innovation, de, 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 les interactions avec les acteurs sont limitées et parfois restreintes à leur, leur plus simple expression. Le deuxième modèle, c'est le modèle de la co-construction des innovations. Dans ce cadre-là, le chercheur, la recherche a une vision assez claire de ce qu'elle veut obtenir, un nouveau système de production, une nouvelle façon d'organiser une transformation des produits agricoles, mais elle ne contrôle pas la production des résultats, des outcomes, et le, la façon d'obtenir ces résultats dans la réalité, sur le terrain, reste incertaine. Et dans ce cadre-là, il y a besoin d'une réelle participation avec les acteurs pour construire des connaissances et mettre au point ces innovations. Typiquement, si on parle de nouveaux systèmes de production agroécologique où il n'y a pas de silver bullet, comme on pourrait dire, et bien finalement, la discussion et l'interaction avec les acteurs est un élément fondamental pour arriver à construire des innovations qui ont du sens pour les acteurs et qui peuvent se déployer à grande échelle. Le troisième modèle est celui de l'appui à l'innovation. Dans ce cadre-là, on n'en parle pas souvent, mais c'est dans la réalité, on le voit appliqué de manière assez, assez importante. La recherche ne maîtrise pas du tout le processus d'innovation. Ce sont les autres acteurs qui le maîtrisent et qui pilotent l'innovation. Et dans ce cadre-là, la recherche contribue à l'innovation en fonction des demandes qui sont exprimées pour apporter des connaissances, pour apporter des méthodes, pour aider à évaluer, pour construire des argumentaires. Typiquement, par exemple, quand on a des projets de recherche et innovation avec des paysans qui expérimentent et qui pilotent l'innovation, ils font appel à certains chercheurs qui vont les aider sur des points spécifiques et la recherche est pilotée, finalement, la recherche et l'innovation est pilotée par, par, par ces producteurs et leurs organisations. Le dernier modèle, c'est le modèle de l'innovation ouverte. Alors, l'innovation ouverte peut être vue comme l'innovation multi-acteur et renvoie à la co-construction des innovations, par exemple, mais l'innovation ouverte, originellement renvoie beaucoup plus à une, à une conception de la recherche où la recherche produit des résultats, a une forte maîtrise dans la production de ces résultats, mais les, les résultats de cette recherche vont être pris en charge et développés sous forme d'innovation, sous différentes formes, par différents types d'acteurs. Typiquement, c'est la mise au point de de base de données ou de, 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 de logiciels par la recherche avec une forte maîtrise des processus de production de connaissances et des outils technologiques par les chercheurs. Mais ces outils peuvent être pris, repris, hein, hein, repris par d'autres acteurs pour développer des, des logiciels spécifiques, pour développer des outils d'apprentissage, pour développer des outils de com communication de différentes manières. Donc voilà différents modèles d'organisation et d'intervention de la recherche pour pouvoir jouer les différents rôles. Je vais terminer juste sur un certain nombre de messages pour récapituler ce qui vient d'être dit. D'une part, on a besoin d'avoir une vision large de l'innovation avec cette perspective de système d'innovation, d'une part pour comprendre l'innovation, mais surtout pour pouvoir l'accompagner d'une manière efficace et ne pas avoir un discours trop simpliste sur ce qu'est l'innovation et comment accompagner l'innovation. Le deuxième point, c'est que la recherche peut contribuer, je mets peu parce que dans certains cas, l'innovation 
n'inclut pas la recherche, elle peut être conduite par d'autres acteurs, publics ou privés. Donc, la recherche peut contribuer en jouant des rôles qui sont divers et ne pas simplement penser à la production de connaissances et de technologies, mais chaque fois que la recherche a joué un rôle significatif dans l'innovation, elle a joué une diversité de rôles euh, au-delà de la production de connaissances et la mise au point de technologies. Le troisième point, c'est que le modèle d'organisation de la recherche, eh bien, il, est, il est variable, il n'y a pas qu'un seul modèle, et que ce modèle d'organisation de la recherche dépend du type d'innovation qui est accompagné ou qui est développé, mais aussi de la distribution des ressources, des ressources au sens ressources cognitives, des ressources financières entre les acteurs et des choix stratégiques que veut faire la recherche et les autres acteurs pour pouvoir développer cette innovation. Et le dernier point, c'est que finalement, quels que soient les modèles d'intervention de la recherche, que ce soit le transfert, ce que j'ai appelé le transfert de technologies participatives, la co-construction, l'accompagnement ou l'innovation ouverte, finalement, on a toujours une approche multi-acteur et que c'est bien cette approche multi-acteur qui fait interagir recherche et autres acteurs qui est un élément déterminant pour pouvoir contribuer à l'innovation et contribuer à l'impact à grande échelle. Merci. Parfait, Guy. Donc, euh, pour ceux qui sont intéressés dans la présentation de Guy, vous trouverez déjà sa présentation en ligne dans le lien dans le chat. For those who want to have Guy's presentation, you will find it when you click on the link in the chat box. Over to you, Agri, in Accra, Ghana, early in the morning. I guess it's 7.30 your time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Francois. And uh, I hope, yes. Um, and uh, thank you to the Desira team for giving me and giving Farah the opportunity to share about uh, this subject of research, the contribution of research to innovation. My name is Agri Agumia. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation at FARA. Uh, I'll just uh, complement uh, what uh, Guy has, has, has presented uh, by presenting two uh, uh, cases of uh, where we have uh, um, uh, FARA together with the, with the partners have uh, tested and, and validated uh, two approaches to uh, uh, innovation where research uh, has played a key role. Uh, but I'll, I'll start by uh, giving a very uh, small introduction about, about FARA and how it plays into the innovation space. Uh, FARA is a forum for agricultural research in Africa. It's part of the architecture of agricultural research and innovation on the continent. Uh, at the national level, you have national agricultural research and innovation systems. And then uh, within each region, uh, we have a sub-regional organization that organizes and brings together the national agricultural research systems uh, uh, yeah, within the region. And then at the apex, you have the, uh, the you have FARA, the Forum for Agricultural Research. Now, the extension uh, actors have uh, also a continental organization called AFAS, the Africa Forum for Agricultural in, in Advisory Services, uh, which links with the sub-regional organizations at, at, at sub-regional level and at national level with the national extension systems. So that's how uh, we are organized and uh, when we are uh, engaging in, in, in work that covers uh, more than one country, uh, it's, it's done through the sub-regional organization and then, and then through FARA. And the, and the work uh, that is carried out by the different organizations is uh, guided by the subsidiarity uh, principle. 
Now, there is a growing interest in innovation by uh, the research uh, fraternity, especially. And this interest uh, dates back to about uh, 15 to 17 years, uh, when it became very clear that the linear approach was not uh, delivering the, the goods that the researchers uh, expected. And they also uh, had some indications that the innovation systems approach would uh, uh, provide better uh, results. But there was no uh, certainty about it. So there was uh, an experiment that FARA was uh, mandated to carry out to test whether indeed the innovation systems approach is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is viable and whether it offers uh, uh, better and, and superior uh, outcomes. And so over time, there's been a, a, a big uh, shift uh, as awareness about uh, innovation uh, increases and as the evidence that it's, uh, uh, it offers better uh, results, uh, as, as, as that evidence becomes available, uh, we see that shift. Uh, for me, uh, from what Guy has uh, presented about the linear approach, and the innovation approach, uh, that diagram there made it very clear for me why uh, the difference between between the two. That in the linear approach you have you have that stepwise uh, process, whereas in the innovation approach you have a network, a kind of arrangement where things move uh, faster. The first case is on the integrated agricultural research for development approach. Um, this is uh, uh, the, the keyword there would be that it is integrated, uh, integrated uh, around four, uh, four, the integration is around four areas. Um, uh, normally in, 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 in the agricultural research, we, we are aiming to uh, improve productivity, improve access to markets, natural resource management policies and institutions. And in the linear approach, the um, the focus is 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 mainly to improve one of those uh, 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 outcomes, improve productivity or improve natural resource management. In the integrated agricultural research, you are looking at uh, the interfaces between all all all, all those areas. The interfaces among them, if it's uh, productivity and 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 and, in a, and natural resource management. You're looking at the interface between productivity and natural resource management, as well as improving productivity on its own and improving natural resource management on its own, and so on. Now, the main instrument for the IAR4D approach is the innovation platform. Uh, the innovation platform is an institutional tool that facilitates the services that Guy has, has mentioned. It, it facilitates the generation of technologies and, 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 and knowledge, and uh, it uh, facilitates capacity uh, strengthening. It facilitates uh, uh, the application of the knowledge uh, to create development outcomes. So that's, that's, that's the main tool. Uh, there's uh, a lot of um, uh, interest and uh, excitement about the innovation platform. We've had so many uh, uh, projects which have uh, embraced the platform. We have institutions that have embraced the innovation platform as, as, as the model and tool for uh, carrying out research. So, the characterization of the platform is that uh, it's a multi-stakeholder platform and uh, the stakeholders are those uh, they would depend on, 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 the, on the problem uh, being addressed but they are typically uh, researchers uh, private sector the extension uh, uh, producers um, and, and policy makers and the key to the success of a platform is its facilitation. 
So the facilitation is, is, is so critical that uh, success is really conditional uh, on it. But the composition of the, uh, of, of the platform really depends on what it sets out to achieve. But those that I have listed are the main uh, actors. We distinguish between an operational platform, which is the one that uh, operates at local level, where you have the producers at local level, the ones who are really engaged in the production. And then we have the strategic uh, platform, which would be like a national level uh, platform where uh, it is engaged in mostly uh, policy and, and, and strategic uh, kind of uh, uh, engagement. The functions have really been uh, uh, highlighted by Guy, uh, so I'll not uh, dwell on that. Now, we have uh, evidence that the IAR4D approach indeed works and uh, offers better results than the linear approach. And this evidence was uh, assembled through a 10-year study led by FARA at working in collaboration with the sub-regional organizations and with the CGA IAR. It was established that IAR4D delivers um, superior benefits than the linear approach. And this, this was very important because it now uh, provided the, the evidence that uh, uh, stakeholders and policymakers needed to uh, now start making a shift to uh, this approach. One of the results is that it sh the, the, the study showed that incomes of farmers engaged in IR for d were 232 percent higher than non IR for d farmers. And there were other uh, indicators, but uh, for time, I will, I will just I like that one only. There are, there are several entry points for the innovation platform. You can have an entry point that is uh, based on markets. You can have one that's based on institutional change, on innovation, uh, capacity, and on social capital or, or natural resource management. I'll just give an example of the market uh, pathway. Uh, this um shows uh, an innovation platform where the entry point is 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 the, is the market linkage and it shows that the aim is to improve food security is uh, to improve food security and uh, minimize poverty uh, by increasing income to increase income you need to uh, increase the profit margin and so there are so many uh, 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 services and, 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 and uh, uh, yes, services that are required to to get to these uh, outcomes. But on the on the top here, my interest is in the research side. Um, for for you to have uh, uh, improved. Profit margin, you need to be producing what is demanded. And for you to produce what is demanded uh, efficiently, you need to deploy research, research to improve productivity, and then to improve the profit margin. So the, 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 this figure goes to highlight, I think, the point that uh, he has, has mentioned that research is a contributor, it's only a contributor, but a very important contributor to the innovation process. And this is uh, just one uh, indication of how, it, how, how it's done. The lessons from uh, our various entry points show that if the entry point is, is, is the market, there is a high likelihood for that innovation platform to be uh, sustainable sustainable beyond uh, most of the platforms that we established in this experiment were project based now several years after the project closed we we have found that the ones that were uh, based on market linkages are the ones that are still standing um, the other 
uh, question that uh, was answered by this uh, uh, study that we did over 10 years was whether the innovation platform is uh, effective in scaling up uh, technologies. Um, it indeed uh, demonstrated that yes, there is uh, th that the innovation platform can facilitate the scaling up, and other studies after the ten years have shown that the innovation platforms have facilitated this, the scaling up. But what they have also established is that the process is not well understood how the, the, the platform does this, supports the scaling up. It's kind of uh, a, a black box. And this is perhaps an area where uh, more, more work is needed to understand. This uh, uh, map shows uh, the, plat the innovation platforms that are in a database that uh, Farah uh, manages. And that database is used by, um, for example, um, private sector actors who engage platforms to um, produce, to, to express demand for uh, commodities that the platforms then organize themselves uh, to, to produce and supply. The second case is uh, the PIPAD, the Platform for Africa-European Partnership on Agricultural Research for Development. Uh, this is a platform that has uh, been uh, on for since 2006, and uh, it's a bi-continental platform with the objective of facilitating African-European partnerships that are, one, equitable, and two, balanced. Balanced between three areas. Equitable and balanced between the two uh, actors in Africa and Europe. Equitable and balanced between researchers and research users. And equitable and balanced between public and private uh, organizations. I'll focus my uh, example on the last two equitable and balance between research and research users and public and private organizations, because that's where the case of the knowledge um, stakeholder uh, partnership uh, is, is, is demonstrated. So within the pipeline, uh, a, a process called the user's late uh, process was uh, developed and tested. This is where the research is you have a multi-stakeholder platform that addresses an issue that is um, uh, mostly um, put on the table or proposed by the, by, by, by the end users. So the, the, the process, the, the research in, uh, carried out in this process is, is, is demand-led. Then the you have as a stakeholder partnership it is demand led so it, it is users led so the, the work that is done is demand led but the, the the users who are mostly farmers benefit from the multi stakeholder platform through the capacity strengthening that the uh, the researchers especially also the the private sector actors bring to to, to the platform and so as a platform, one of the uh, objectives was to mobilize resources for them as a, as a consortium to be able to do joint work. Individually, they could not have been successful in uh, mobilizing the kind of resources they were able to, to, to mobilize. They found that for every uh, euro that was invested in, in these um, partnerships, they were able to leverage 3.3 uh, euros. And if they considered the other uh, non-consortium partners that those partners brought onto the, onto the platform, that ratio increased substantially eight times. One minute remaining. Yes, I'll go to the conclusion. The, the, this, uh, the users led the process partnerships 
many years after the 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 the, the project has ended have continued to grow they they they, they are more sustainable and and and, and, and so that's that's uh, the, the contrast we see with the IAR for the so I conclude that for most innovation in African agriculture, research plays a fundamental role in generating knowledge and technology as he has seen. The innovation framework ensures that research is demand -led. It also ensures that the, 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 the research outputs are, are used. And it does this by building capacity, by facilitating brokerage, networking, and policy. This just goes to uh, reinforce point that he has made. Multi-stakeholder partnerships have proven to offer greater development impact, but they require a long-term engagement. And their results are not immediate, but they are long-lasting. So you have to be patient with, with more sustainability. Another point reinforcing research actors contribute to multi-stakeholder partnerships. In the case of IR4D, a number of the platforms were research led. In the case of the pipette, they were user led. Um, but they, 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 they don't have to be, research doesn't always have to be. Um, and we have seen that user led state, uh, partnerships um, have shown greater sustainability. With regard to scaling, it, we, we need to understand the process through which innovation platforms facilitate scaling so that once we know how it does it we can ensure that um, it is that scaling is sustained and good thank you very much uh, for the extra minute before we move to the poll we have two questions one for you agree and one for guy Avant qu'on passe au sondage, il y a une question dans le chat box. Une est pour Agré et l'autre est pour Guy. On va d'abord poser la question à Agré. So the question for you, and it comes from Myra Roperes. You know Myra very well. She has been working for Farah. She is very knowledgeable uh, on the whole process of how PEPAD started back in 2007. Uh, so her question to you is, does your impact evaluation of innovation platforms, does it include the return on investment in addition to the increase in farmers' livelihood? That was the question. Does the impact evaluation of the innovation platforms include an analysis of return on investment in addition to what it has brought an increase in farmers' livelihood, in farmers' income. What would you, how would you answer this, Agri? Does this evaluation include this type of analysis, farmer income and return yes. on investment? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, the, 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 the work that has been done um, by Farah, uh, has focused on the increase in incomes of, of farmers. The investment, we would want to see the, the, the investment outside the project. Um, we, we haven't done that, but we are aware of uh, some studies that uh, have been initiated in the, in the context of, uh, of PhD studies on the, the return on, on investment. Um, we have not commissioned the, the, the impact evaluation that, that looks at that aspect. But there's a lot of interest in, 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 in this work after the, after the project ended. There are a number of studies, and one of them that I'm aware of is looking at the impact uh, evaluation on return on investment. Thank you very much, Myra. And Maya, Myra, I would suggest that you chip in live <laughs> to ask your question to Guy Faure so that we see you. It's a long time. Welcome, Myra. Hello. 
Myra, are you there? Um, yes, hi. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody. Um, my name is Myra. So my thanks, Agri, for the, for the answer. I think, indeed, that's one of the challenges we have, I think, of this uh, the observation I have in terms of when impact evaluation. We always forget the return of investments. As much as we are trying to improve the farmer's livelihood, we forget how much um, we put effort in putting together um, a project, especially the human resources, the time of people. Anyway, thanks for that. Um, yeah, to G4, which probably is related to this, and you already responded to me on, on, on my question. Um, it's very interesting the different categories you've uh, shown, which is really um, very relevant. But I wonder how much it is affected, the, the use of it is affected by the available grants by donor, which is still very much driven by donors, because most of us are still very much uh, public research institutions. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for the, the question. Uh, you write, uh, ou je, je, je vais répondre en français, puisqu'il y a la traduction. Oui, les, les modèles, euh, les modèles de, de recherche sont largement influencés par les mécanismes de financement en Afrique, mais pas seulement. Hein. En Europe, euh, les financements de la recherche sont aussi euh, très discutés. Euh, à l'évidence, euh, de nombreux bailleurs favorisent le modèle de transfert de connaissances avec des degrés d'interaction, de participation avec des acteurs plus ou moins importants, avec l'idée que ce sont les technologies qui vont permettre de résoudre les, les problèmes et que ce modèle permet de diffuser à grande échelle et rapidement de nouvelles technologies. Donc, on trouve beaucoup de, de projets orientés autour de ce modèle, même si les institutions de recherche, comme le montre le FARA, se posent des questions sur, sur, sur les meilleures façons d'organiser la recherche. Euh, on a aussi le modèle d'appui à l'innovation, euh, qui peut être un modèle utilisé par, euh, des, par des firmes privées, par exemple, pour commanditer des, 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 des études, pour développer euh, leurs recherches. Et du coup, la recherche elle, peut être euh, très, euh, très orientée. Comme je disais, ce n'est pas la recherche qui conduit le processus, mais euh, c'est d'autres acteurs. Et dans ce cadre-là, ben, finalement, le contenu de la recherche et la façon de faire la recherche est orienté par la commande. De, de ces acteurs. Après, sur la co-construction, plusieurs, enfin, plusieurs mécanismes de financement travaillent sur la co-construction. On a bien vu Agré qui parlait de, du projet PEPAR, le, le programme Désiram et l'accent sur ces approches multi-acteurs, le partenariat européen pour l'innovation en Europe met l'accent aussi sur ces approches multi-acteurs dans l'agriculture. Donc, on a des, des, des acteurs qui ont favorisé ce type d'innovation, ce type de modèle d'intervention de la recherche. Pour l'open innovation, oui, certainement, il faut avoir des financements plus autonomes pour pouvoir être plus indépendant et fournir un certain nombre de, 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 de produits utilisables par d'autres acteurs pour développer leur activité. Euh, voilà ce que je peux dire à ce stade-là. You will now see on your screen a first question, a poll. We are already online for about one hour. Uh, one hour is remaining. I only give you like 30 seconds to react. Uh, it's in English and it's in French. So the question is, in your opinion, innovation in agriculture in Africa is rather initiated by and then rank in order of priority, multiple choices, either initiated by research, either initiated by the farmers, either initiated by local private sector, foreign private sector, or civil society. What would be your preference? Kindly, once you have ticked the boxes, submit. And then we will slowly move to the poll results. 
and see where your preference is going. Who is, in general, the initiator of innovation agriculture in Africa? Let's go for the results. It appears on your screen. So surprisingly or not surprisingly, the majority considers that the farmer or farmer organizations will be the ones who will trigger the innovation uh, rather than the research themselves. Uh, it reminds me to a European Commission DG research uh, poll, which was organized four years ago. There was an auditorium of 600 researchers mainly on the Horizon 2020, FP7. And there the poll result was researchers came at the last. So the researchers considered themselves, European researchers mainly, as having least impact on the development, on society, based on research. So they would consider other actors being or having the major impact on innovation. And one of the additional groups was consumers can have an important impact on whether research would trigger innovation. Let's move to the second question. What are the most important role for research to support innovation in Africa? And there you will have different options. The role of research would be to produce useful scientific knowledge for actors. Two, develop new technologies, three, participate in innovation platforms, four, support actors to help them innovate by providing research expertise. So here you can give two answers max. And in the background, you are hearing the clock of my church in the neighborhood, 10 o'clock. Right, let's move to the outcomes of the poll. So the majority goes for indeed the last option, which is to help the actors and support them. So supporting farm organizations, support agri entrepreneurs, and support them to innovate by providing research expertise and addressing their needs. So this clearly shows the preference for what the role of research is. Third question, third poll, is moving now mainly to the drivers, the drivers of change to improve systems. Also there we ask you for two answers. Um, the drivers to improve food systems is A, we must push the new technologies that are at the heart of innovation, this is the first option. Support the initiatives promoted by the actors in the fields. Three, the private sector must be developed to improve production systems and value chains. And fourth, policies. So the drivers for change, four options. What, where is your preference going? Mm. 
right. I think majority has submitted its preference. The results are coming. So here we see the majority goes for the last option. No, it's the, yes, 71%. So it's about policy. Policies need to be improved to create a truly incentives framework for actors. So it's recognized that without a policy framework, without a policy environment, it is rather difficult to have an impact of research. And then the last, Last poll, constraints, constraints for scaling. It's a question which comes over and over again, scaling innovation, going from a pilot project to higher scale. As the proverb is going, pilots never fail, pilots rarely scale. A, because of a lack of match, between innovation and the needs of stakeholders. B, because of difficult access to information regarding innovations. Three, the weak capacities of actors to innovate. Four, the lack of adequate services to develop innovation. So here also you are given the possibility to give two answers. And with this, we will close the polls. That is the fourth question. Let's now have a look at the results. So here, <clears throat> the majority goes for the last one, which is the lack of adequate services. So again, the whole environment of service providers or the lack of it is uh, hampering innovation. This was just a, a poll for <clears throat> keeping us all awake. We are presently 64 participants online. Let's now move to the panel discussion and I'm very happy to hand over to Helena. Uh, Helena Postumis, who is out of Amsterdam. Uh, she's working for the Koninklijk Institute for the Tropen, which means from Dutch to English, the Royal Institute for the Tropics. Helena, up to you. Um, thank you, Francois, and I do need to correct you here because it's true that on Monday, at the beginning of this week, I was still working for the Royal Tropical Institute, but now I'm working for Wageningen University and Research. Um, so I, during the week, I made a switch from one to the other. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to see you all here, and I'm very honored to present a diverse panel to you who will each share their own experiences um, on innovation in agri-food systems. And each of them will give a short presentation to convey their, their insights um, on how innovation in agri-food systems can be supported. We will have a question and answer session um, after the four presentations. So during the presentations, during the discussion, please put your questions in the question and answer box so that we can come back to that um, after the presentations. For the, the panelists, um, I do need to warn you that I have, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I have, <laughs> no, you can't. I have a timer on my phone um, to keep time. So you have each five minutes to um, present your key messages and then um, I will have to cut in and ask you to wrap up. So first up, we will start with um, Mr. Selvarajou Ram Ramasamy. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. My apologies. Um, and I will each introduce each panelist as they as it's their turn to present. So Selvarajou is head of unit research and extension um, at the FAO and leading FAO's efforts in agricultural research and extension, agricultural innovation systems, amongst others. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. So the, the mic and the screen are yours. Thank you, Elena. 
uh, hope you could see my uh, video as well as my presentation. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to share our experiences in strengthening the capacity to innovate at the national level. Uh, as you're aware, innovation is key for agriculture transformation uh, to meet the uh, sustainable development goals. Agriculture research in that context is central to unleash the potential of uh, agricultural innovation. Considering the importance of research and other actors uh, in unleashing this potential, we used an approach called agricultural innovation systems. Uh, this uh, consists of uh, a network of actors uh, that includes individuals, organizations, enterprises, and supporting institutions, together with uh, policies and strategies that enable uh, functioning of these institutions and multiple actors. And they bring existing and new products and services processes and forms of organization into social and economical use to achieve the specific objective that can be to addressing a particular problem. Uh, this particular approach promotes a dynamic interaction among the multiple actors facilitated by multi-stakeholder processes uh, that can unleash the potential uh, of uh, innovation. And of course, you know, this was uh, very frequently highlighted in, uh, in the previous presentations. We promote this approach and strengthen the capacities at the national level uh, using several tools and methods through a global multi-stakeholder mechanism, a facilitation mechanism called Tropical Agriculture Platform. As part of the uh, DCIRA uh, Tropical Agriculture Platform Agricultural Innovation Systems Project, the approach is implemented in nine countries. Uh, I would like to highlight what we do uh, in two countries, just to give a flavor uh, of uh, what role research can play uh, to, to promote agricultural innovation among various actors. In the Malawi case, our focus is uh, to, to strengthen the enabling environment, especially at the policy level. This includes support, uh, um, the research institutions can support uh, for joint learning from successful innovation cases that is ongoing at the country level, especially focusing on local level interventions. In this uh, particular case, we are building on our experiences uh, from farmer field school approach. That is also in a way multi-stakeholder platform at the local level that promotes mutual learning as well as uh, addressing you know, uh, the specific issues. Um, the research institutions can also join, uh, join in the joint uh, prioritization of agricultural innovation systems that includes um, research extension and education farmer linkages, strengthening these linkages, and uh, also with marketing and business support and technical and policy support. The research institutions can also play a critical role in identification of key organizations, essentially that is also an entry point, and uh, they, can, uh, they can promote and conduct self-assessment of their capacity needs that can be addressed through the policy processes as well as other standalone capacity development initiatives. So the overall, uh, uh, this approach can contribute to facilitate uh, and also provide evidence-based informed policy making uh, that, can, that can promote upgrading of researcher skills uh, equipping multi-stakeholder platforms to facilitate farmer-led innovations. The overall objective of uh, this intervention is to unlock the full capacity and full potential of agricultural innovation to address the emerging and also existing challenges. And uh, this is addressed by strengthening the functional skills, the soft skills of the research institutions and also multiple actors of agricultural innovation systems. In this particular Malawi case, we are working very closely with national agriculture research systems, extension services, international organizations, education institutions, and also farmers organizations. 
Coming to the second uh, uh, example in Burkina Faso, and this is a different level because Burkina Faso already has a national innovation strategy uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, hosted uh, with the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation since 2011. And uh, we try to closely align with the objectives and priorities of this national strategy. And that led to policy dialogue and uh, that promoted uh, key improvements in the system that includes new financing mechanisms and service supports for agri-food processing sector, development of semi-industrial agricultural machinery manufacturers in agri-food processing, that's more of uh, entrepreneurship, the local entrepreneurship. And this also increased the access to microcredit, improved linkages uh, between education and innovation, Innovation in this context is a multiple actors. And this also promoted uptake of new professions such as innovation facilitators, business coach, and the incubator managers, etc. Our support in that context that focused on organizational coaching, facilitation of inter-organization collaboration, and also new support services through the new multi-stakeholder centers that encompass the activities of uh, providing multiple support to the innovation actors. Can you uh, please key, um, wrap yeah, up, Sergeant? This is my, the last slide, of course, the third one. Key messages, the role of research institutions. The research institutions need to support the ongoing innovation processes. Of course, that clearly came up during the poll. Uh, processes led by multiple actors that includes farmers organizations, public and private services, etc. Investment in research institutions are still very much needed. This is an issue that uh, did uh, that did uh, that was not highlighted in the poll, um, and of course this is very surprising. This is a key uh, aspect that we need to look into uh, the investment in uh, especially the public sector research is, uh, is also um, being declined uh, over the years. Uh, TAP Agricultural Innovation System project focuses on some demand-led training and joint learning between researchers and other AAS actors. Um, the key message from the two examples, the one is to support the evidence-based policy making and informed decisions that includes data generation monitoring progresses and mutual learning, and also advocate for new investments. And the second level is at the institutional level, support the design of incubators and service centers for increasing the efficiency of support services to meet the demand of multiple actors, not only the farmers, of course, in this case, it's a multiple actors. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you for that. Um... I still have, we still have about two, two minutes. I just want to ask you one question. Um, I'm glad to see that you also look at the side of research is what capacities we need to develop or what capacity strengthening is needed because often when we talk about uh, capacity to innovate, the, the immediate thought is what capacities may farmers need or farmer organizations or private sector in the terms of small uh, medium enterprises. Um, from your experience, if you think about a multi-actor approach, what are the, the main capacities and skills that local researchers require to be able to engage effectively in a multi-actor approach? Yeah, thank you, Elena. I think as I already mentioned, uh, you know, there is, uh, there is substantial technical skills uh, these institutions have. The most missing factor that, uh, that uh, led to all these issues is the lack of soft skills, uh, that is functional skills. Uh, navigate the complexity of different organizations and to what extent they can collaborate and they jointly learn from each other and co-create knowledge to address the specific issues. I think that was highlighted in the previous discussions as well. Our focus uh, is more uh, towards strengthening the soft skills, that is the functional capacities that is lacking um, among the institutions. And of course, uh, uh, towards that, establishing 
or promoting multi-stakeholder mechanisms at the national level and also at the local level is critical. Uh, so strengthening the fun functional capacity should also be uh, complemented by promoting establishment of formal and informal multi-stakeholder mechanisms, which is, uh, which is uh, critical to have a joint learning and also co-creation of knowledge. Thank you. Um, we will come back to you um, later on in the Q&A session, but as now time is, is up <laughs> for the first introduction from your side, um, I want to move on to the next panelist. And um, this will be Mr. Again, I will try to pronounce your name correctly, but forgive me if I'm wrong. Mr. Olan, Olan Tumbosung Tijani. Um, Mr. Tijani is a Nigerian British entrepreneur and co founder and CEO of Co Creation Hub. It's, this is a pan African innovation enabler that works at the forefront of accelerating the application of innovation and social capital for a better society. And I'm really curious to hear from you, Mr. Tijani, how you do that or what you do in this respect. Um, and also probably good to know that, that Mr. Tijani was named as one of the 100 most influential people on the continent by a new Africa magazine, quite an achievement. Um, so Mr. Tijani, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alina. Um, and and it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm guessing everyone can see my slide. Yes, we can see it, but can you put it in presentation mode? Okay. Uh, see if that works. And to full screen, maybe. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So, so it's a pleasure to be here. And, and I have to, to say I'm a bit of an outsider uh, in a way, uh, because my interest is more in digital innovation, uh, but also I've been in the position of joining the recently put together advisory group uh, by the European Commission, which is focused on uh, mainstreaming research and innovation between the in the relationship between Africa and Europe. Uh, and in the course of this work, uh, because I support innovation, and I've seen on the continent that there's uh, a strong demand and interest in seeing how we can drive up productivity, uh, but also uh, strong outcomes in the critical sectors that Africa is, is looking at. And agriculture is one of those sectors. Uh, and as we can see, there's an emerging interest, but also a growing interest in the application of digital innovation in particular uh, in agriculture. And you know, if you look at what GSMA put together in last year, GSMA actually put together a report, uh, which is a map of all the innovation uh, focused on information and communication technology innovation and digital solutions within the agriculture space. And, and, and you know, GSMA found about 437 different uh, innovations. And you know, you may be asking yourself as we talk about innovation, as we talk about research within the agriculture space, why is digital innovation important? There's so many reasons to why digital innovation is important. For those who are following the trends here, the opportunity for resources uh, that goes into digital, digital innovation is way much more than what you find for, for traditional research. Uh, you know, because you now find multiple actors who are engaging in funding digital innovation. A lot of these guys are investors. You know, you have development agencies also funding this. You have smart individuals who are entrepreneurs who are starting their own startups, looking for really interesting solutions uh, using most of the emerging technologies that we know today uh, to make society better, some of them to uh, give opportunity to businesses to be able to do their business better. And it's the same thing you will find within the agriculture space. In some of the work that we've been doing, uh, we've been looking at some of these so-called digital innovation in the agri space. And some of the top areas that we came across for those who follow the trend, of course, you will know about the crowd farming phenomenon on the African continent where access to capital is now being driven through crowdfunding platforms uh, for farmers. So farmers who now struggle, who used to struggle to find funding uh, you know, for their farm can now through this crowd farming platform, raise money from the crowd 
you know, and this is an exciting development that is cutting across the continent. We've seen the largest ones being farm crowded, uh, which is from Nigeria. Trif and Greek is another example, but also complete farmer is also one of those that, that are quite popular on the continent. And simply these guys use digital platforms to mobilize resources from the crowd, you know, give it to farmers get returns from the farmers and give it back to the investors. The jury is still out on how effective this model is, uh, but this is an interesting model through which digital innovation is disrupting access to, uh, to funding. Another one which we've seen, which is growing significantly is actually precision agriculture, uh, you know, which is the use of things like remote sensing, uh, you know, satellite technologies to help farmers improve the efficiency of how they manage their farm. And you see companies like Aero Robotics, for instance, who recently raised about 17 million US dollars from investors to come up with really exciting solutions for farmers across the African continent and behind. Some of these companies are also using technologies like drones to help farmers improve how they manage their farm and in essence improve the outcome. Another one that is beginning to also still early stage on the continent is agroecology. And, and one company in particular, and I have to give the caveat on this one, I don't know how successful this company is yet, but it's an interesting company that is doing fog farming. You know, it started out from, from Cape Town where there was water crisis and this company decided to research and come up with fog farming solution where they capture the fog and try to help farmers use the water from fog to actually farm, uh, which, which I find extremely, extremely interesting. The last one, which has been on the continent for a while, but is also now improving is what we call the advisory and information services using digital solutions. As you start to see more farmers gain access to mobile telephony, whether it's through their SMS or through internet, we're seeing more solutions that providing real-time data and information to farmers to help them improve. And what we did when we started this trend was to use um, the theoretical framework, uh, which is the sectoral system of innovation, to try to understand what is driving all these digital uh, innovations that we're seeing within the agriculture space. And this framework gives us the chance to do these analyses on the three broad categories. The last speaker spoke to quite a number of these categories. But what we did was we looked at the actors and networks that are driving digital innovation that we're seeing on the continent. On the other hand, we looked at the knowledge and the technological domain. What do we now know or what technologies are there on the African continent that is driving this emergence and surge in digital innovation within the agriculture space. And lastly, we looked at institutions and by institutions, we mean policies, regulations and norms that are driving innovation. And you will find that it's actually quite exciting. The reason why crowd farming became a thing, for instance, in most African countries was actually the fact that there was no regulations in place for crowdfunding. So this is how you see that lack of regulations at times can also lead to innovation, especially in the digital space. Because there was no policy for crowd, crowdfunding, people were able to create this platform, raise money from the crowd, direct it to the farmers, and, and in the process, they were able to give access to funding to some farmers. You know, what you are now seeing is some countries on the African continent are beginning to come up with crowdfunding uh, policy, which is good, but we have to be careful that these policies don't then end up killing innovation. When you look at the actors and, and networks, and this is quite important for stakeholders within the agriculture space, that when we talk about innovation, let's not limit it to the traditional actors because you're seeing the emergence of non-traditional actors and network that are participating in, in, in innovation within the space. So you're seeing the fact that well, small older farmers are contributing significantly. Aggregators are becoming also powerful in understanding how to innovate and how to get innovation to, to, to the farmers. Extension workers are still there. Off takers are playing a major role as well because as they're desperate, uh, to get more yields and get more results and produce from the farmers, they also want to ensure that the farmers can produce efficiently to meet their needs. You know, fintech startups are playing a major role. Financial service providers are becoming active. 
DFIs are also doing a lot in this space now. You know, you see the likes of GIZ from Germany that is investing significantly in this area in agriculture across the continent. IFA International, which is an NGO, is also playing it. You, so you'll find a lot of organizations in this place. Tech investors, technology investors are becoming a major player in agriculture. So we cannot ignore them. So you have a list of all these organizations, GSME, that are now becoming active in agriculture because they see the potentials for agriculture in Africa. And they understand that digital innovation can actually help to drive productivity uh, and improve the outcomes of the sector. Another thing that is- soon, Sorry, can you wrap up? <laughs> I need to cut you short. This is the last slide. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I've not used five minutes, but anyways, another thing that is quite important that we need to look at is also the role of space technology. Space technology is also becoming quite efficient in the space. And, you know, the fact that the policies around space technology on the African continent is also beginning to be more liberal. So you're seeing the application of exciting new solutions. You're seeing organizations like Airbus, for instance, also playing a major role in precision agriculture on the continent. And lastly, is the knowledge and technological domain. The list is there. I'm sure my presentation will be shared. I hope I didn't spend more than the time allocated. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, you're very enthusiastic, but it was also very interesting um, presentation that you, you shared with us. Um, I do have, please stay here because I want to ask you a question. Um, because I'm sure that some of us, at least I was listening to your story with a bit of jealousy when you said there are plenty of resources, there's a lack of policy, which gives you a lot of, which gives a lot of freedom in this space to innovate. Um, and I know that in more traditional projects, whether it's research or development, there's often a lot of bureaucracy and there's, there's a limited resources available. So I wanted to ask you, what do you, could you say a bit more what attracts these investors um, to this space of innovation? Um, and whereas they're not attracted to invest in more traditional research, for example, or development projects that also try to uh, push innovation in agriculture? Uh, well, I, I think over the last couple of years, it's obvious that digital technologies are beginning to shape society really strongly. Uh, we're seeing the power of internet like we've never been seen before. Uh, and, and what this means is that there's a cohort of investors who understand how destructive uh, these digital technologies can be. The fact that these digital technologies can take out uh, gatekeepers Right, and these gatekeepers oftentimes are those who actually waste a lot of resources that have traditionally been there. You know, you give the money to the gatekeepers, a ton of it is spent on meetings, on, on stakeholders who really don't do what needs to be done to get access to the farmers. And it's been documented that Africa has significant opportunity to create immense wealth to contribute to how we solve the food crisis in the world. You know, but traditionally, innovation within the agriculture space has not been very, very attractive. We've not seen uh, much growth in it. And it's the same thing you find in financial technologies. There's foreign funding that is now coming into the space. So because they see the potential, Africa has population to feed. If you invest in agriculture, if agriculture is effective, you're guaranteed to make good returns. And these investors are, are looking for spaces for good returns. So, so agriculture is one of those areas that for those of us in digital technology and innovation, it's going to become really more exciting. You're going to see more innovation money from the private sector coming into it over the next five to 10 years, because people see the chance to create a value in, in the sector. So what is your one uh, piece of advice to researchers who are now thinking, actually, I want to explore this space of innovation. I want to engage with the non-traditional actors that you were talking about. What is the one piece of advice you would give to researchers to, to move into this space? I think it's application. You, you agree with me that research in agriculture, there's been a lot of groundbreaking activities, but when you look at the outcomes and you look at how many of them get to application, you know, applied research, you, you agree with me that there's too many knowledge on, on the shelf. Uh, there's too many knowledge on the shelf, even across Europe, that can help Africa agricultural sector to be more effective. But the journey to proper technology transfer and actually getting it to the farmer is too long. And most of the time, this never happens. We've not been able to bridge that gap. 
So anyone who is looking at these stakeholders needs to understand that their interest is in seeing farmers use the solution. This is the, they're not trying to fund innovation from the, for the fun of it. They're funding innovation that can actually get to the hands of the farmers, help to improve the outcomes from the agricultural sector and create wealth for both the farmers, the investors and the economy as well. Thank you. We move on to the next panelist, um, but I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question to one of the panelists, please put them in a Q&A box. Also add your own name because um, we cannot see all the names of the people who are in the room, unfortunately, due to a technical issue. So when you post your question, please add your name and your affiliation. Um, I want to move to our next um, speaker. And, and this is Elisabetta Gotar. And she is an agricultural economist working at uh, at SIAT, the Center for. Am I saying this good? Well, you you can explain yourself. Um, you're you're currently leading the program on performance, innovation, and strategic analysis for impacts at the Alliance of Biodiversity International. Um, so, Elisabetta, the floor is yours to share your insights, experience, and um, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm working for one of the CJR Center. Now we are merging into one CJR, uh, the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SIAT, uh, based uh, in, uh, in Rome. Uh, I'm also co-leading uh, the um, uh, cluster in the CJR research program on root, roots, tubers, and banana on foresight and impact assessment. So I'm going to share with you today some insight that I've gained over the years uh, in dealing with uh, uh, impact assessment, uh, uh, prioritization, foresight analysis uh, of CJR uh, innovations. I'm gonna share my screen. Apologies for not being ready. Um, uh, sorry, I uh, share screen. Okay. Um, can you see my screen now? I guess so. No, not yet. Uh, share. Too many platforms, uh, too many innovations in technologies these days. <laughs> we so see your now screen. I trust, uh, you can see my, my screen. Can you put it in presentation mode? Yes, uh, here we go. So I'm going basically to, to repeat all the one hour and a half we have spent so far together has been extremely informative because uh, you know everything uh, uh, we have say, Guy have said, and, and the others uh, we we have experienced it in reality also in uh, in once in in the, in, in the CGIR. Um, uh, we need to develop uh, demand-driven impact pathways that are leading research innovations uh, to the big SDG. Uh, and we, we have seen in, in RTB, in the CJR program on roads, tubers, and bananas, also on the work that we do uh, at the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT, that uh, you know, we have uh, very short-term uh, impact pathways that are leading technologies uh, to productivity gains uh, and to reduction of poverty. And those pathways are easy to measure, easy to monitor. There are no many uh, co funding factors that has to be taken into consideration during the analysis, but the complexity arises when uh, we want to follow those uh, uh, impact pathways that are not so uh, short term and direct, but are following route that are intricate. Uh, and this is especially the case if we want to analyze the impact of uh, innovations and technologies on natural resource management uh, or uh, on, uh, on, on, on the environment uh, or on outcomes that do not have monetary uh, values. So the classical return on investment analysis uh, cannot always be um, applicable. Um, uh, 
so the, 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 the development of those long term and intricated impact pathways has implications not only in developing clear and sound monitoring and evaluation framework, a strategic monitoring framework that are letting us understand not only the pathway of one uh, innovations, but also how the interactions of different innovations are contributing to the outcome and to the impact. And we need to understand what are not only the big uh, lag indicators that we want to measure, uh, but also what are the, the small leading indicators to the big change. And we also need to develop a credible theory of changes in support of the impact pathways that are letting us understand the how this change is happening, how these innovations are uptaken and scaled up. Uh, what is this, the science of scaling? There is a new research portfolio that is actually starting once the technology and the innovation is, uh, is released. Whatever innovation we are talking here about, the development of an improved varieties or best practices around the pest and disease management. So what is the journey that starts? What are the actors that are involved along the, the journey? And, and what is the relationship of these actors? We need to understand whether there are bottlenecks that might hinder the advancement of the technology along the impact pathways uh, and, uh, and mostly we need to understand what are the transmission channels that are enabling uh, the advancement uh, along the, the impact pathway. So those are all uh, elements uh, uh, that, in my opinion, are, are needed if we really want to link research innovations to big development outcomes. And, uh, um, uh, and that we need to, uh, and that, that, that we need to, uh, to monitor. Um, so how this can be done, uh, we, we need to develop an evidence-based system. So we need to be systematic in collecting whatever information uh, and uh, evidence we have of the technologies. And uh, uh, we need uh, to, you, you, you know, we, to, and through this evidence, we need to ch channel these technologies and innovation along the intricate impact pathways uh, that are going beyond the project life cycle, because here we are talking about funding of innovations and technologies uh, that most likely will have an impact once uh, the grants, the project is over, once we have stepped out from the, from the, from the, from the field and there are other actors coming in. So somehow we need to track back uh, all, these, uh, um, all this journey. Um, and, and, and therefore the importance of having a, a, a strategic results framework that is enabling us to understand this. And then we also have to understand uh, what, what, what are the stage gating technologies and, and innovations that are mature enough for being scaled out and, and really analyze their contribution to the high level impact. Not all innovations have the same degree of maturity and not all innovations are contributing at the same level to the big uh, impact uh, outcome. And therefore, we need to understand also what, is, what are the nested theory of changes across these innovations and how they interact to, uh, um, among each other. And again, and what are the actors that then can scale them up so that we can really measure um, impact. Um, so these are my, my key messages that I wanted to reiterate to, uh, to you all, because I think are key messages that we need to keep in, uh, in, uh, in mind. So the importance of having a sound strategic results framework 
with, uh, with a clear monitoring system, monitoring indicators, uh, measure indicators, but also using uh, prioritizations and scenario settings for foresight analysis that can also help us guiding those, those innovations along impact pathways. So it's really, for me, it's uh, the interactions of three major functions around priority setting and, and foresight analysis of innovations, monitoring on innovation and assessing the impact of innovations. So learning is happening across these three functions uh, and are enabling us, the interactions of these three functions are enabling us to measure impact in the long terms. Over to you, Elena. Thank you, Elisabetta. Um, also a question for you. Um, in, in the impact pathway of bringing research um, into use, supporting innovation, supporting impact, um, where in the research process or along the impact pathway do you see a role for, for non-academic actors if we think about the multi-actor approach? Um, can you say something about that? What is How can other actors feed into your impact pathway? Or where, where do they appear? Since the beginning, I think the paradigm of uh, uh, scientists bringing the innovation uh, on their own, uh, it's over. Uh, so the importance of co-designing those innovations based on the demand, uh, on the need uh, that, are, uh, um, that, that are out there. I, I think it's uh, it's key. I, I see also, you know, th this is uh, related to what uh, my my colleague Rafael was saying before. Uh, another uh, uh, another must to have now along these impact pathways is is the need of multidisciplinary interactions uh, across us. So it's not anymore the economist uh, assessing the impact of a technology, uh, but he's uh, or, or the uh, genetist uh, developing the, uh, the, the improved varieties to be distributed, but it's really the interaction with, you know, with farmers associations, uh, with anthropologists, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, you know, with economists, uh, with sociologists, and understanding what's the best way of presenting the new technologies. So for me, the, the partners are now key actors since the beginning of the develop, development of the research innovation. Otherwise, uh, we, we will get always uh, stop uh, at the, you know, once the grant is over, 10 journal articles published, uh, and uh, we all forget. We move somewhere else, uh, new projects, new activities, and we forget uh, the, the innovations that actually are there, but needs to be pushed and promoted. Thank you. We'll move on to our last panelist. Um, and I'm very happy she, she can also join us in this discussion um, because our last um, speaker will be Madame Anik Sesibera. And she is chief executive of the Confederation of Farmers Association for Development in Burundi. Um, it's, the acronym is CAPAT, um, which is a national federation, gathering more than 100 cooperatives and 150,000 members. So if we talk about a farmer representative, Madame Sesibera certainly is a farmer representative. Um, so, Madame Cecibera, la parole est à vous. Est que... eh, merci, Madame oui. Elena. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Eh, merci pour l'opportunité. Eh, comme vous venez de le mentionner, donc moi, je travaille pour le, la CAPAD, qui est une, une organisation paysanne, et vraiment au Burundi. Et, et, au cours donc, des dernières années, nous avons, euh, avec les organisations d'appui, donc les ONG, avec les agriculteurs, pour nous appuyer dans notre réflexion de se et les agriculteurs membres de, euh, de s'orienter vers la et, 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 et,
Pardon, la ligne est mal, on ne vous écoutait pas. Dans l'optique et dans l'objectif, et pour ne pas aller de faire. Vous ne m'entendez pas? Allô? Oui, maintenant, oui, Allô? mais à fois, ça, ça coupe. Ah, je vais essayer. Et... Ah oui, ça me montre que mon réseau était, était instable. Mais la présentation, donc, je, euh, vous voyez le partage écran? Oui, oui, on voit la, la présentation. OK, d'accord. Donc, euh, je disais que donc, euh, notre, la méthodologie qu'on a utilisée pour euh, cette orientation euh, vers l'agroécologie qui vise à l'autonomisation la, des agriculteurs membres d'OCAPAD, surtout euh, dans tout ce qui concerne l'approvisionnement, mais aussi les pratiques agroécologiques. On a utilisé la méthode pour construction et pour création des, des connaissances. Et, et cette méthode euh, a été facilitée par le GERDAL, et parce que tout d'abord, on a mis en place un cadre de collaboration multiple acteur, et parce qu'à nous seuls, euh, agriculteurs et la CAPAD, et on ne pouvait pas y arriver, donc on a été appuyé par les chercheurs, notamment l'Université du Burundi et, et l'Institut de recherche aussi du Burundi, ainsi que, que le GERDAL et, et les ONG, notamment une ONG belge, le collectif stratégie alimentaire, ainsi que et, une ONG française, et le CCFT. Et donc, autour donc, euh, de cette euh, thématique d'autonomisation des agriculteurs, il a fallu d'abord des préalables. Les préalables ont été et, le renforcement de capacité des équipes de notre euh, organisation, la CAPAD, parce que nous-mêmes, depuis plusieurs années, on avait été et, tant, donc, orientés et vers un autre, un autre type d'agriculture, l'agriculture conventionnelle, mais aussi tout ce qu'on avait appris à l'université était orienté beaucoup plus vers l'agriculture conventionnelles et les pratiques agroécologiques étaient considérées comme un peu, un peu archaïques. Au sein de cette donc, cadre de collaboration multi-acteur, l'appui de la recherche a été l'amélioration la, des connaissances paysannes et pour proposer des innovations qui répondent aux préoccupations des agriculteurs. Ici, je peux donner exemple euh, sur la euh, selle pour permettre à, à l'agriculteur et, et aux paysans de pouvoir lui-même multiplier et sélectionner ses semences et les conserver et de s'approvisionner sur le marché euh, une fois sur quatre saisons au lieu de le faire à chaque saison comme euh, le modèle conventionnel le, le voulait. Donc, ils nous ont euh, apporté euh, des améliorations mais aussi cette recherche eh, autour de euh, la multiplication de semences paysannes eh, a permis eh, aux chercheurs aussi de confectionner la méthodologie, mais aussi de faire une mise à l'échelle facile. L'appui donc des organisations internationales et des ONG a été la facilitation donc, du processus autour de la recherche à l'action, mais aussi l'échange d'expérience à travers des appuis techniques et, et financiers, mais aussi a permis la vulgarisation de ces innovations euh, en milieu paysan et une mise, une mise à l'échec, comme je venais de, de le souligner. Et ici, je vais donner un exemple, je vais vous donner un exemple concret d'une telle collaboration, donc multi-acteur, autour d'un sujet qui préoccupait les agriculteurs. Et, et on a essayé et, de tirer donc les chercheurs de l'ISABU, donc l'Institut de recherche du Burundi, vers cette préoccupation et, autour donc, de l'utilisation du, du titonia. Et... On avait donc des, des connaissances. Euh, si la façon, mais aussi par des observations, on a euh, de l'utilisation par le paillage. Après, il y a eu d'autres expérimentations euh, chez les agriculteurs expérimentateurs qui ont commencé à utiliser, à utiliser le titonia 
comme un ingrédient de compost et ils avaient observé que ça améliorait donc euh, les éléments nutritifs au niveau du, du compostage. Et certains ont commencé à l'utiliser comme, euh, comme, comme un liquide, comme bio pesticide sur les plantes et d'autres les mettaient en, en poquet. Et au niveau euh, de l'organisation paysanne, donc au niveau de, de la CAPAD, on a essayé de poser donc la question aux chercheurs s'ils si avaient de leur côté fait la recherche sur si les meilleures utilisations euh, du titonia et si oui, et quel partage on pourrait faire ou quel échange on pourrait, on pourrait avoir. Donc, on s'est rendu compte qu'effectivement, au niveau de l'Isabou, ils avaient fait la recherche sur titonia, ils avaient une fiche technique, ils avaient comparé les modalités d'utilisation en comparaison avec les engrais chimiques, mais et ça ne répondait pas exactement à la préoccupation qu'avaient les agriculteurs et de l'utilisation euh, du titonia en comparaison, par, par contre, par la, euh, avec la famille, la famille organique et le rôle que pourrait jouer le titonia, soit pour améliorer la famille organique en soi, mais aussi pour améliorer la fertilité des sols. Donc, on s'est réunis avec les agriculteurs, avec les abus, bien sûr, avec la facilitation de Gerdal, d'abord pour traduire cette problématique des agriculteurs en question en thématique de, de recherche. Et il s'en est dégagé et trois thématiques sur lesquelles on s'est convenu de travailler de commun accord dans le cadre d'un processus de recherche participative pour euh, regarder l'efficacité euh, du titonia sur la fertilité des sols. Et, bon, et aussi et essayer de faire la recherche autour des meilleures utilisations possibles pour bien conseiller l'agriculteur, mais aussi regarder et finalement quelle quantité nécessaire pour euh, améliorer la fertilité des sols avec, euh, avec le titonia. Et, et les modalités, donc, on s'est convenu aussi des modalités de, de recherche et qui, et qui étaient basées sur le recueil des pratiques qui existent chez les agriculteurs. Et, et de faire des évaluations sur les critères qu'on s'était convenus ensemble. Et on a conduit des expérimentations, des expérimentations à milliers paysans, chez les agriculteurs et expérimentateurs, mais aussi des expérimentations au niveau, au niveau de, de la station. Et je pense qu'il y a quelque chose qui a, qui a sauté. Qui a sauté ici. Donc, en, en conclusion, cette collaboration euh, acteur, euh, plutôt agriculteurs et chercheurs, avec aussi l'implication des autres a, des acteurs, si le, les aspects, que ce soit les aspects de l'enforcement de capacité, les aspects de coaching sur, le, sur la méthodologie, et nous a permis jusqu'à maintenant de résoudre des, des problèmes et de répondre aux préoccupations des agriculteurs en essayant de réfléchir aux alternatives, mais aussi à l'amélioration des, des connaissances, et non pas en arabe peut-être si des, des connaissances et toutes faites, et, mais en essayant d'améliorer ce qui existe en milieu, et, en milieu paysan. Et, et il y a quelque chose qui a sauté sur le défi par rapport à, à cette collaboration euh, multi-acteurs, à cette collaboration euh, autour donc de la recherche co-constructive, où euh, les grands défis pour l'agriculteur, en tout cas, euh, dans le contexte burundais et de de terre, la préoccupation majeure pour l'agriculteur, c'est euh, nourrir sa famille et en, tout en intensifiant sa, son exploitation. Donc, il a besoin euh, de des vous... innovations euh, de recherche qui sont adéquates et s'il vous plaît, si vous pouvez euh, terminer puis, votre et, présentation. Et oui, je vais vite pour, pour terminer. Et je dirais que la plus-value de cette collaboration multi-acteurs est, est l'amélioration la, des connaissances par les chercheurs et cela par donc, la validation scientifique, mais aussi par la clarification des méthodologies. Et aussi, et cette clarification de méthodologie permet de rendre les résultats plus réplicable et diffusable. Je dirais que eh, la difficulté, c'est que souvent, eh, il y a moins de préoccupations eh, réelles des agriculteurs, mais aussi que, comme les autres l'ont souligné, souvent, les projets de recherche sont financés par des projets qui sont limités dans le temps et malheureusement qui ne donnent pas 
le temps d'investir et de tester des innovations aux besoins du monde, du monde rural qui demande souvent compréhension, patience et temps, d'où l'importance des politiques nationales pour soutenir le développement autour de l'innovation participative. Je vous remercie. Thank you um, for this presentation. Merci bien. On n'a plus de temps de poser une question, je crois. Um, we only have five minutes left in this session, and I'm looking at the Q&A box to see if there are any questions for the panelists. But Francois, um, I also want to invite you in here if you see any questions that we can still pose to the panelists before we, before we close. Um, non, je propose que pour les questions, on passe directement euh, à la conclusion maintenant euh, et éventuellement on peut contacter ceux qui posent une question individuellement, offline. Then I give the, the screen and the mic back to you, François, if you want to um, move to the closure. Right, so... I now suggest that Guy is giving a wrap up and then we have then at the end, Christophe Larose. Uh, the overall Leap for FNSSA week has now at 11 a.m. A, an important panel with senior speakers. So let's not extend too much this present webinar. Guy, over to you. Okay, thank you. Merci, merci. Juste pour rappeler quelques points à partir des différentes présentations. Euh, moi, je retiens trois, trois, trois points autour de l'approche multi-acteurs. Euh, eh bien, il est évident que toutes les présentations ont évoqué ces questions d'une manière ou d'une autre, mais de manière très nette. Et c'est une reconnaissance de l'importance de, de ces approches multi-acteurs. Euh, néanmoins, les, présenteurs, les présentations ont montré que cette approche multi-acteur euh, doit être envisagée à différents niveaux. Hein. Agré a parlé du niveau local et d'un niveau plus stratégique, qui peut être un niveau national ou un autre niveau, mais que ces approches multi-acteurs doivent être vues dans une di différente dimension. Ces approches multi-acteurs aussi euh, s'expriment différemment suivant les secteurs. On a bien vu qu'avec la présentation d'Annick, euh, à travers euh, l'expérimentation paysanne, on a des approches multi-acteurs qu'on va dire euh, non pas classiques, parce que les, là, les paysans sont sur le, sur, conduisent et gèrent le processus d'innovation, mais on retrouve des acteurs classiques. Tandis que Tidjani nous a fait part d'un nouveau secteur qui émerge avec le digital et de nouveaux acteurs et des nouvelles préoccupations. Le deuxième point, c'est l'appui à l'innovation. Euh, l'appui à l'innovation était la question centrale finalement, puisque les, les, les intervenants ont parlé de, de la recherche, mais surtout de comment accompagner l'innovation utile pour les, pour les paysans. Et on voit le besoin de nouveaux, de nouveaux services, de nouvelles fonctions. Selva Rajou a insisté sur le rôle de facilitateur agréé aussi. On voit des nouveaux services comme les incubateurs pour favoriser des entrepreneurs, mais on voit aussi des nouveaux services du digital, très nettement, qui se développent. Et Tidiani nous a bien montré que ça se développe très vite, même s'il y a certainement des difficultés, comme l'a noté quelqu'un dans le chat. Et le troisième point, c'est sur le rôle de la recherche. Euh, J'ai été surpris que, notamment dans le, le pool, que l'ensemble des participants reconnaissent une diversité de rôles 
et que même le rôle le plus important n'a pas été la production de connaissances. Donc, c'est assez surprenant. Mais en tout cas, cette reconnaissance que la recherche doit jouer un certain rôle. Elisabethin a insisté sur le fait que pour jouer ce rôle-là, eh la recherche doit être stratégique et, et, et doit développer avec les autres acteurs des chemins d'impact et de, des outils de suivi et évaluation pour l'apprentissage, pour pouvoir piloter, enfin en tout cas, comprendre où on se situe dans le processus d'innovation et noter les points de progrès et d'amélioration obtenus par l'ensemble des acteurs, dont la recherche. Voilà, je vous remercie. Christophe Oui, merci. Je vais aussi être très rapide. Euh, simplement euh, pour euh, évidemment remercier hein, les participants au, au panel. Euh, je pense qu'on a eu un, une diversité d'interventions et, et de perspectives qui quand même euh, montrent l'intérêt sur le sujet et à la fois la, 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 la complexité du sujet, mais aussi des, euh, des, 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 des approches qui, euh, qui ont euh, quelque chose de relativement explicite et concret à montrer euh, sur le terrain. Euh, ce genre de séminaire est une illustration de ce qu'on compte euh, faire et faciliter à travers cette euh, facilité Désir à Lift que l'on a lancé, euh, lancé hier. Et donc, euh, je pense qu'il y aura encore des, des séries euh, d'événements de, de cette nature qui, euh, qui, qui nous aideront à, à avancer dans la réflexion et produire euh, de l'évidence sur un certain nombre de ces sujets notamment sur la pertinence et l'impact de, de ces approches multi-acteurs, où manifestement il y a encore un, un travail important à faire pour en démontrer l'importance. Euh, Ce que moi je voudrais simplement dire pour conclure, c'est que effectivement l'innovation doit quand même chercher à répondre à des problèmes, et puis aussi euh, l'innovation doit euh, se, se poser la question de l'innovation pourquoi et euh, on peut, en fonction des acteurs, avoir différentes perspectives. Euh, la création de valeur, euh, c'est certainement un élément important. Évidemment aussi, euh, vu les, les enjeux auxquels font face, euh, fait face notre, notre monde, euh, la dimension de, de création de valeur a, doit être positionnée euh, dans la perspective de la gestion durable euh, des ressources naturelles, de la biodiversité et de la réponse et de l'adaptation au changement climatique. Donc, simplement pour, pour remercier, euh, ne pas empiéter sur les autres sessions de, de cette semaine euh, organisées par l'IPRO FNSSC. Et euh, voilà, remercier les uns les autres pour, pour l'intérêt et la participation au cours de cette discussion. Merci. Excellent. So then I suggest that uh, our dear interpreters and Céline and Barbara, but also Aira, just switch their camera on so that we can see them wave them, thank them for a great facilitation of this session. Merci beaucoup, Céline. Merci beaucoup, Barbara. And thank you very much, Aira, out of Switzerland. Merci. While Céline and Barbara out of France, uh, they were, I think, incredibly helpful for having a smooth session for two hours. Uh, you have deserved a wonderful weekend and hopefully with some sun. So bye-bye for now and uh, hope to see you next time in another session. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.